Hello, everybody. <laughs> Sounded weird. <laughs> Welcome in. Today it is uh, Wednesday, the 17th of July, 2024. That sounds right. We're off to a rolling start. Welcome in all my uh, friends and members to the uh, latest live broadcast where today, well, the members already know we've made an attempt on this board earlier uh, to get it installed into a mini ITX case, and that did not go well. So for those of you who are members, you will recognize what's about to happen because this is the, what I hope is the conclusion of this build video that we attempted on Monday. What I ended up doing is I was looking for another mini ITX case. We're trying to move some parts away from Studio B into the upcoming Studio C and the, uh, the idea of moving motherboards and RAM and storage and power supplies, you know, if I can put it all into just one case, it's a lot easier to move it. On the other hand, if I have to buy a new case, then that's more stuff I have to move. I found myself in quite the dilemma. So on Monday's members only video, I took what I had laying around for an extra power supply, an extra case, this motherboard from Mini's forum, the BD770i. I thought, well, let's just use all these parts we've got laying around and get it built up. And then uh, this motherboard won't work in that case. So, okay. Then I have to decide, what do I want to do? How much money do I want to spend? And that's when I found, through just looking around on Amazon for a unique solution that's not just the same old, same old, I found this new case, which comes with a power supply, and that helped to justify the cost. So if... If the power supply I ended up using can go right back in the box and be used as brand new again in some future build. And the other mini ITX case we used, uh, again, can go right back in the box, brand new for some future build. You know, nothing ventured, nothing gained. My only concern is I haven't really done much research on this, but I think everything's going to work fine. Let's go over to... Inwin's website because the case we're going to use today and all the links by the way they're in the video notes of course below the video it's called the b1 now this is a case i've not seen before let's see if i can share it with you there it is so the b1 case is a very unique looking mini itx housed case that obviously would not have any room for an internal graphics card, right? So we're going to run off onboard video, which is what I intended to do anyway. And it's really intended to be sort of a media PC. You can stand it upright. You can lay it flat. Um, it is going to be exceptionally limited in expandability, but we don't want to expand it. Everything we want is already on the board. And, you know, it tells us the height here. And I haven't measured. I think we're going to be okay, but uh, we'll find out during today's live, unscripted, and unrehearsed video. I paid for this case. It was not sent to us um, by the manufacturer. They don't even know who we are. We've never worked with Inwin before, but they have some pretty unique cases. Not sure that makes them better, but they're definitely different. And so this is what I've ordered. It comes pre-installed with a 200 watt power supply, which is perfect for this build. Again, we're not gonna be adding a discrete graphics card. It also comes pre-installed with an 80 millimeter fan. And then we have our standard mini ITX board dimensions, which are always the same. So the only concern would be height. Down below the board, it looks like, looks like we have room for a two and a half inch drive. Two two and a half inch drives from the looks of it. And I'm going to guess those feet either go on the bottom or they go on the side. So you can lay this horizontally or lay it flat. Now the price on this, just to give you an idea, at $125, if you subtract out the cost of the power supply. So take, for example, when we tried doing this on Monday, we used the $75 power supply. That was way more power than we needed. And we used a $70 case. So if we subtract out the $70 we're saving on the power supply, then it's only a $55 case. And suddenly, okay, that's 
reasonable. I'm willing to put that into this to finish it off. I do really like the motherboard from Minisform that we're using. And we have a link to the original review of this board on December 1st is when we did that. And that's in the video notes as well. If you want to, uh, if you've missed that, you want to get caught up. But the Minisform uh, BD77i is the board we have today. You see, they've got a line drawn through it here, meaning it's no, not available. They have the newer updated Ryzen 9 version versus the Ryzen 7 that we have. That's come out later, the 7945HX, which they call the BD790i instead of 770i. Other than that, it's the same board, as far as I can tell. And uh, of course, there are mini swarms running all kinds of specials right now with Amazon Prime Day going on. This is now the final day of Amazon Prime. It runs for two days. And Minisform is running their discounts there at Amazon. So just in case you were thinking about buying one, you might want to look at what the prices are today. All right, let me get back over to camera one. Here we are. Hello, everybody in the chat. There's our friend Oysting joining us from Norway. El Perez says hello. Andy Kane says hello. Welcome in, guys. Veng Pao Tao became a supporter. Thank you, Veng. Our friend Buster Peter Laycock joining us all the way from Scotland is now a member for 26 months. Of course, a big shout out and hugs to our friend Buster. Good to see you, my friend. John Williams says hello. Paul Gray says hello. There's Doman2000 jumping in and says hello. Lou Greenia, David Graham, Mark Gaines, James Carter, Jose Lopez. I'll say hello. Dave Bat says hello. There's Stealth Mode. Our friend Buster with a 10 pound super chat contribution. Thank you, Buster. Marco Maelstrom joining us all the way from Italy. Welcome in, Marco. Marco. Is that how you say it? I'm not sure. <laughs> they roll their R's. Um, Abdul Azim Patel with a $9.99 super chat. Thank you, as always, Abdul. Of course, I'd be remiss if I failed to mention our friend Frankie B out there in New York. I don't see him in here today, but he's a very generous contributor and uh, want them to know how much that means to me. Charles Purdy with a $5 super chat. Right on. Thank you, Charles. Marco says that's perfect pronunciation. <laughs> All right. So what I got um, when I ordered the case from Amazon, it was yesterday. It arrived today. The Inwin case. And it comes in a little box. And in the little box, this is what it looks like. I have not remove this cover myself. I'll be seeing it live and in person at the same time you are. So we get a real genuine reaction here for better or for worse. Let's see what we got. Oh, those feet are tiny. I thought the feet were going to be bigger than that. All right, we're done with that. That's smaller than the box the motherboard came in. Well, at least width wise. Let me bring it up close to the camera so you guys can take a look. Here we have, I'm just wondering how those feet are supposed to move to the, they're little tiny feet. They sure look bigger than that. Anyway, so here is the front of the case with a single USB type A and a headphone, microphone, 3.5 millimeter audio jack. I'm sure there's a power button on this thing somewhere. I don't know where. Oh, wait, what's this? Feel it. It's right there. Yeah, good luck finding that. Um, nothing on the sides. If we come around the back, we have a proprietary power supply. I think I'm going to be in a world of hurt <laughs> if that power supply ever dies. Where the heck am I going to get another long, skinny power supply like that? Inside, you can see our power cables and uh, some other uh, accessories. I see that 80 millimeter pre-installed fan right there. There's not a whole lot to it, but that's what I like about it. It's simple. And it certainly doesn't look like a PC. And they do show it on its side like this where somebody's put their headphones on it as a headphone stand. Yeah, that works. Sure, you can do that. 
Uh, as for those feet, I don't know if we have to unscrew these or if they unclip or how that works to put feet down on the bottom. But let's find out. Let's figure it out together. I like to do all of my videos unrehearsed and unscripted. As a real working computer technician, I am constantly put in unfamiliar scenarios that I'm expected to untangle. And so why not just do it live on YouTube? We've also got a little baggie here, which includes some screws and some zip ties and a QR code to a user manual. Okay. Larry Wood with a $20, is she talking about the base? Because that looks like it's screwed down. Hmm. This one might need a user manual for me to figure it out. I'll show you what I'm looking at here. Uh, first, let's get this bag out of this. Oh, well, that's what this is. Okay. So the feet on the bottom stay on. They don't come off. And then you get this little stand, and you just set it down into the stand like that. It's just when they take the marketing photos, I, I, I don't know, did they take the feet off of it? Because I didn't see the feet in the marketing photos, but maybe they turn it in such a way that you don't notice them. Either way, that makes it, well, that's the back, but that makes it super easy to stand upright without having to do any work. I'm okay with that. <laughs> Certainly our thoughts are with our friend uh, Buster, Peter Laycock in the chat room. Uh, lost his sister recently, and certainly our, our thoughts are, are with him. I know it's a difficult time, and, you know, we're, we're here. We're thinking about you, and we're always available. If you ever need someone to talk to or just want to be around friends, you know this is a, this is a, a second home. I hope you consider that as a, a safe place that you're always welcome, of course. Uh, let me go back over to my chat room over this way. Right. So. So that's our base. All right. Anyway, let me bring it back up and show you what I was looking at here. What we have. We have a couple of screws just on the one side here by these feet. And then if I turn it this way, you'll see there's underneath the lid. I'm not sure how easy those are going to be to get to. We've got two screws. But again, nothing on this side. So it's a little uh, asynchronous. What's the word? Not asynchronous. There's a word for that. Um, it'll come to me. I might need to pull the documentation on this because I'm not sure. I mean, I can take the screws out and see what happens. Also, something else I just noticed down here, there are little arrows pointing in opposite directions. If I bring this up and you look really closely right up by my finger, and you'll see that again on the other side. Right, right there. Hmm. Let's try something. I really don't like to have to look in the manual. I want to see just how intuitive this is. It would figure I would get a delivery. All right. Um, let's take a look here. Just those two screws. Is that all I need to remove? It's a little bit difficult to tell because of all the what appear to be layers. 
but it's that very first one here in the middle that separates out. And then that's going to give you access uh, to the two, two and a half inch drives, which is really interesting. Uh, much like a mini PC, they're giving you the SATA slots so you can just slide your drives in. You don't have to worry about running the cables through this little narrow area. That's a really nice touch. Even though I have no intention of using a SATA drive, I have stopped using those a long, long time ago, uh, except in maybe a NAS, you know, like a big mechanical drive. For people that want to use them, they've made that very easy. And it looks like that's all you have to do to get to this. We've got uh, what appears to be perhaps a way to remove those feet if you really didn't like them, right? If you wanted to keep the thing upright, I guess these could come off. Probably leave you with a couple of little holes that these feet go into. We've got this, uh, the two pieces of plastic that stick out that lock it in the one side and then the screws lock it into the other side. That explains why there's only two screws on it. Now, I don't know if the next screws are the same, so I'll keep these screws over here with this just in case they're a different length or a different thread. And now let me come at this which I think I have to remove these two screws. Yeah, they're very different. These are much shorter screws and a different finer thread type. So we'll take those two out. And I'm happy to say that those screws go into brass fittings. So we're not drilling into plastic because that usually doesn't, often doesn't end well. Now I don't know what that just did. Hmm. Hmm. Whew, it's a hot one today. Can I, let me tell you, it's going to be 116 this week. Whew. I'm already feeling it. Let's see here. Hmm. Some people are mentioning some buffering, but everything on my side looks green. I've, I've got zero drop frames, so any buffering that may be occurring uh, could potentially be on your side, the viewer side, or on the YouTube server side. But we're feeding the YouTube ingest server 100% with no problems, just FYI. All right, so where was I? I'm trying to figure out what those two screws did. Hmm. Well, that's going to leave a mark. There's the inside. There's our power cable. This is a laptop clover, clover leaf style power cord, pretty standard. Let's move these screws over here. Let's take a closer look at this lid and figure out what the heck hurt so much. I think what happened was it broke free and I reversed direction to push it back down because I don't want to use my momentum to potentially break it and you can see it kind of dug into my skin a little bit but no blood right there that's that used to be fully attached <laughs> and this is what i was talking about there's these little brass fittings so yeah those screws were definitely holding this lid in you don't want to try and pull up on this lid without removing those screws first and that's all there is to the lid nothing much to look at here but now that I know that that's being held in with clips, perhaps a spudger would have been a better idea. But that's what the documentation's there for. We haven't caused any harm except to myself. And I'm a holesman. That means I heal. I bruise easily, but I heal fast. So we're okay. Now, looking into the rest of this, 
we've got our <clears throat> two SATA cables for data and two SATA cables for power that are coming off of those connectors on the other side. Let me just bring this up so you get a good close look and a very, very unique power supply. I've never seen a power supply this thin before. That's maybe an inch wide. Maybe two inches wide. It's got a little lip right here. But this is the power supply, which claims to be 200 watts. That's our included 80 millimeter fan. As you can see, that's sucking air in, right? Because you see the supports. So it's going to suck air. Wait a minute, other way around. It's going to blow air out. <laughs> My bad. It's going to suck air in from the case on this side and blow air out that side. That's how that's going to work. And then there's probably some kind of a fan in the power supply, I'm going to guess. And it's going to blow air out these vent holes here, usually. Um, of course, we've got a spot here for an IO shield. We've got the power connector for the fan. And then, like I said, the SATA data and power for, unfortunately. So there is a choice. You, if these cables, is this, if this is something you don't want to cable manage, it looks like you can take the two screws out and just take the whole harness off for one drive or each drive individually or together. Just take these, it looks like you just take these two screws out and then you can remove these if you're not using them. And it's gonna keep the inside cleaner. And then again, looking at the back of it here, where the two, two and a half inch drives would go. And they do have a nice little diagram I didn't notice before. Etched into the plastic here. So who needs documentation? It's all right there. So the first concern I have is, is this, Motherboard going to be too tall. I don't think it is, but huh, been wrong before. Um, what do we have to do? I don't know what this cable is for. It looks like a grounding cable. Hmm. So that's fan. Let me just check something here. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. So we've got one of the SATA connectors coming off the power supply plugged into a, a connector here, which is feeding, I'm going to guess, what is that feeding? Oh, this is our USB and front port audio right there. Okay. I was wondering what this little circuit board was. So this power connector is feeding. Very unusual design, that is. Uh, the SATA plugs down here at the bottom. I still don't understand what this ground plug is for. It certainly looks like we can take those out. Let me just verify this. It'll also make my install easier. Come out. Yep, sure does. And it looks like, it looks like both of these uh, two and a half inch SATA drive holders share the same power cable. So you cannot just remove one. You, you either have to keep them both or take them both out. I'm going to take them both out for right now. Like I said, I have no intention of using them, but we could certainly put them in a plastic bag with the screws so somebody could add them back in. They are proprietary. They're only going to fit with this case. So you can see how that's in there. You should be able to just pull that down. There it is. Now, <clears throat> just so you can get an idea how this works. 
what they've done is they've given you the connectors that go onto the back of a hard drive. And they've already connected power and data. And so the data connector will go onto your motherboard. And if you're using the other one, the other data will go on your motherboard. So you don't have to worry about cables that are too long. And then as far as power goes, they're going to provide power from one cable to the next unit and then into your power supply. That's all there is. It's a really simple little thing. And what we can do is we can fold that up. Like I said, we can put it in a Ziploc bag or something and keep it with the machine with all the spare parts. Because I have, have I said I haven't had any intention of using it three times yet? I have no intention of using two and a half inch SATA drives. But look how much cleaner the inside is now to work on too. It's going to be a lot easier, better, better airflow. And why is my phone still beeping at me? Oh, because I didn't put it on Do Not Disturb. That would explain that. Okay, now, um, is this going to fit? That's really the ultimate question. and We can find that out real quick. We know that it's got to go in right towards the I.O. shield here, which is, hopefully I have the I.O. shield in the box. But before I get ahead of myself, let's just make sure we're not going to have any clearance issues here. Ooh, that is close. That is super, super close. I mean, we are right there. So now my question is, if I get these cables out of the way, ooh, there is not much room for cable management in here. Holy cow. Um, okay. I don't know how that's supposed to work. Same. The cables are really in my way of putting this lid back on. And I'm just trying to seat it temporary. Oh, there's a filter right here. Did you notice that? So. Oh, wow. Wow. Okay, so here's the deal. Remember I said I wasn't sure if this was going to be too tall or not? It is right there. I mean, right there. It just fits. Now, of course, I got to put the IO shield on, but that's effectively what it's going to look like when it's done. I, you know, I've got to screw the board down and hook the cabling up and then figure out a way to route the cables in that tight space we've got. But that is just perfect. Like we wouldn't have maybe a millimeter or two to spare. Thank goodness we have that mesh top, so that's going to let this power supply fan. Well, not a power supply fan. It's the, the system fan, the CPU fan, and um, NVMe drives and everything underneath of it. That's going to be able to breathe just fine, as long as we don't put anything on top of it. And, of course, if we want to sit it upright, we can totally do that. As long as it can breathe. I don't know. I think that's going to look pretty good. I just guessed. Oystein said he's getting some buffering there in Norway. Alan Lindos joining us from Casa Grande, Arizona with a $7.77 super chat. He said, I'm not sure if I can super chat to you, but I'll try. I sent you an Amazon gift card yesterday. I hope you got it. Uh, yeah, uh, I got your Amazon. Um, obviously, I've got your super chat. Thank you, Alan. With regards to an Amazon gift card, I don't recall getting an Amazon gift card from you yesterday. We have had numerous issues with people misspelling my email address, and that's usually why we don't get them. 
but I will let uh, Mara confirm. Thank you, Alan. All right, so I can move confidently ahead knowing that the worst part of this build or the most challenging part is going to be the cabling because we're just, we just don't have much room to work in here. Mara says we don't have an email from you, Alan. So I'm going to guess you might have typoed the email address. You should be able to go into your Amazon account settings and look in your order history and verify whether or not the gift card's been redeemed, recall it, or you know, change the email address, or reach out to Amazon customer service during their, their live chat. And they'll assist you with it as well. So the other thing I'm wondering at this point is if there's an easier way to separate this without injuring myself. And my guess is where I showed you those arrows earlier, there's little tabs, and I just didn't know which direction those went. So I just lifted up on them and it came out a lot easier. So just using these little tabs right down here, which are right by the arrows that are facing opposite directions, that looks like the way to do it. So this will fit, we're okay. And now let me make sure I've got the IO shield. Now, some of these cables, they're right here. This is our USB 3 for that front port. This is our audio header for that front port. And then, no, it isn't. This is a, <laughs> what is this? This is probably the front switch and LEDs is what that is. And then this is our audio cable. And again, I don't know what this grounding cable is for. It's got a spade connector on it. I don't know why. And then we've got our fan. After that, we just need to hook up motherboard power. And we should be good to go. These mini ITX boards, they only take four screws, one in each corner. That's universal across all mini ITX boards. 200 watts is more than plenty for what we've got here. So let me take a look in the box. And I hope I've got the IO shield in here. Oh, and it's black too. Nice. Okay. Oh, we got spare screws. We've got some documentation. Oh, we have an antenna, a big base antenna. Cool. I forgot that was in there. the board we're using and the IO shield is a little concerning I don't know how that's gonna stay in this is a really nice IO shield in the sense that it's uh, bring it up to the camera here and I'll show you on the one side you know it's very attractive On the other side, it's got some nice foam in here. So you're not scuffing it up against the back of the board. But <clears throat> I don't see anything that holds this in. Other than, I suppose, the pressure of the board pressing against it. Um, let's try some. Should go in this direction. Yeah, see, nothing is going to hold that in. Nothing. Not exactly sure how I'm supposed to. Well, once again, once the board is installed, the pressure of the board against the IO shield is going to keep that in place. But that's certainly not a traditional mounting method. Let's see how this will work. Maybe I need to put it on the board first. Oh, 
I'm starting to think that the nuts that go around these Wi-Fi antennas have to come off. And then the nuts from the Wi-Fi antennas will go back on because this is still um, not quite seating flush. And I think the nuts on the Wi-Fi antenna nubs here are what's preventing us from seating flush. And then once that's installed, and then the nuts go back on, that would be what locks this in place. That's very strange. So let's, uh, let's try that. I don't know what size those are. I might have a nut driver that's that size. Let's see. Let's try, what is this? This is an eight millimeter. Nailed it, perfect. Eight millimeter. Let's see. I'm just guessing. Well, I can see the heat sink could be in the way. I also see two holes right above each HDMI port. As those screws hold that in. So maybe it's a combination of both. I kind of feel like it should have been installed this way from the factory. We don't need to get that too tight. But I'm going to say that looks like that's how that goes in. I'm going to bring this up to the camera and show you. Now, that's a very unusual I.O. shield install with the nuts on the Wi-Fi antenna stubs here holding it in, and then I have two points above uh, the display port and the HDMI port here that look like they help keep this straight. So I'm gonna guess in the box is likely some small screws for that. Let's just check the box again. Let me set this down. That was, um, that was new. Ah, yes. We have two very teeny tiny screws. That explains that. I know when I um, looked at the uh, parts that were included with this board, I was thrown by what are these screws for? And at the time, I may have concluded they must be for holding on the I.O. shield. But I never thought about the nuts on the Wi-Fi antennas getting in the way of that I.O. shield sitting flush. But these are super, super tiny. Which resolves my next concern was with the head of the screw getting in the way of seating the HDMI or DisplayPort cable. They are really, really super tiny. I thought maybe those were M.2 screws. 
but let's see if they fit. Samuel Kowalski with a $2 super chat right off. Thank you, Samuel. Okay, those are, man, you don't want those to just go rolling off the desk. You'll never find them again. And you're gonna, you're gonna need a jeweler screwdriver to get at these, so let's do that now. At least once we put them in, they won't go anywhere, right? Oh yeah, that's exactly where they go. I'm just going to get them started because I can't tell if the IO shield's straight or not. And then I'll make sure that we can get access to the ports without the IO shield getting in the way. Then I can tighten those down. It's like right there. Wow, that's very unusual, but it's a great clean look. If it had come from the factory like this, I probably wouldn't even have paid any attention, to be honest. But because I had to assemble it myself, and I'm not quite sure why they wouldn't put that on at the factory, but you can see this IO shield is being held on by, once again, the nuts on the antenna uh, screw ports there. And then the two little tiny screws that we just put in, one here and one there, made sure that these holes are lined up straight. And then tighten those screws down. Don't over tighten them, they're very small. You can overpower them. Just get them right when they snug up. Just give them a little tiny bit more and you're good. Now, that was, <laughs> I didn't expect I was gonna need these little drivers for this build. So this is the fun, at least from my perspective in my line of work where I get to work on something different without any preparation. It's just like playing a video game where you gotta figure it out. And um, I don't know, I just, I think it's fun. Okay, so let's try this again. So with the IO shield now attached to the motherboard, we should be able to go down in here like this. And if that seats properly, that should look real good in there. Oh yeah, it's like it was meant to be meant to be now i am having a little bit of an issue with the mounts lining up but that may be because i'm sitting on a yeah i am sitting on a cable so we got to get these cables out of the way we don't want to screw the motherboard down onto a cable and pinch the cable potentially uh breaking through the insulation and creating a a ground point that would not be fun still feel like something's not quite lined up here there it is okay so in the bag that came with this case there'll be our motherboard mounting screws i hope so here, let me bring this up to the camera and show it to you. This is a nice, clean little, um, much thicker than a Ziploc bag. It's kind of the thing. Um, sometimes when you buy products at the store, they come in a bag like this. We've got some zip ties. We've got some screws. And then that, that QR code right there will get you to the, I guess it's, That'll get you to the user manual. But we also have a link to the user manual in the video notes as well. So either way, it looks like we've also got some rubber feet in there to go on the, I guess, on the... You know what these might be for? These might be the little covers. If we want to set this vertically and take the feet off the bottom, remember I said it would expose some holes. I think these little stickers, let me... Again, let me come back up now that I've realized what this is. These little stickers look like they would cover those holes up if you chose to, to mount this vertically and you didn't want the feet on the bottom anymore. See, they're very thin. So they're not feet themselves. They just look like covers, and that's what I bet they're for. 
Who needs a user manual? You should be able to use critical thinking and common sense to figure this out. Alan Lindos contributes a dollar. Hey, thank you, Alan. Samuel Kowalski says, what about the M.2 drive? Well, the cool thing about this motherboard um, is it can support a couple of M.2s. And we took care of installing RAM and M.2 when we initially reviewed the board back in December. And that's why we have this crucial T700 sitting here. It's a Gen 4. This is a Gen 5. One of the reasons um, this board is priced as it is, is it's already equipped with everything you need for modern CPU, modern Gen 5 NVMe transfers, heat sinks, a fan for the NVMe. And the only thing you have to provide is your cooling fan, which I've added this ugly Noctua. And then you also have to provide your own um, laptop RAM and your own NVMe or NVMe, plural, NVMe's drives, and I believe this will hold two of them. Um, but if you're interested in that, go back and uh, we have a link to the original review of the motherboard and you can watch us prep that back on December 1st. And then it's been sitting ever since. I haven't really done anything with it until this week. Wasn't quite sure what to do with it. It's not that it's, there's anything wrong with it. I just, I have no shortage of computers over here. And again, the only reason this kind of came up is I thought I'm going to have to move all this stuff, you know? So why not put it in a case and just move the case? Well, then the case wasn't the right, it wasn't compatible with this layout. So uh, I had to undo all that work. We have a very large bag with a little tiny bit of screws in it. And those are just standard case screws. And then we've got these smaller shoulder screws. So the screws with shoulders, let me show you what that means. It means that underneath the head of the screw, it is not threaded. Right there. And if you look closely, you'll see as you get to the base of the screw, it's got what we call a shoulder on it. And those are usually used when you're going to slide something in and out of a slot. So when I showed you earlier how you can add two and a half inch drives, two of them to the bottom, and they had those little cutouts, these screws are for using in those drives so you can slide them into the cutouts. Just like uh, a picture frame where you've got the little slot and you use it to you know, put it on the hanger. The screws act as that way where you will put the drive into the wider part of the hole in the back of the case and slide it up and uh, I'm not quite sure how it secures. I haven't gotten that far, but I'm not really, I'm not planning to put any two and a half inch drives in it now for the fourth time, so I don't care. But I know I don't need those screws for the motherboard install. And it looks like they've given us seven screws. I don't know why we only need four. Presumably, these are the screws we use for the standoffs under the board. So let's find out. Dustin Fuller renews membership. Now a member for 26 months. Right on. Thank you, Dustin. Hmm. I bet you I was looking for that screw some time ago, and now I just found it. <laughs> Fell in the drawer. Wherever that came from. Um, I have scissors somewhere. Somewhere. Found them. So these are your standard uh, case screws. Nothing special about these. Let me make sure they're, yeah, I was afraid that wasn't going to be magnetized enough. Let me grab my better driver here. It's always right in front of my face and I never see it. Very important to work with a magnetized screwdriver for just that reason. And let me make sure I'm not pinching any cables. We look pretty good and lined up on this side. 
And then I have to push this forward. To get it to align, which is weird. But the IO shield's giving us a little pushback. But these are the right screws. They are, they are tightening down. Yeah, this is requiring a lot of pushing forward to get the holes in the motherboard to align with the standoff. So it's a tight fit. Um, not impossible, but definitely a much tighter fit than working at a standard, you know, larger case where the board locks in without much uh, struggle. So you don't want to tighten any of these screws down until you get them all started, or you might not be able to shift the board Remember, the board may not only need to be shifted forward and backward, left and right, but also tilted from twisting it one way or the other to get these holes to line up exactly right. Now, once you do get them lined up, it should be a pretty simple matter then of just going around and tightening them down. It doesn't matter what order you go in. You just don't want to leave any blank because when you start plugging things in and out of it, if there's nothing securing the board in, it's going to move the board around. And it's going to be frustrating for you to plug things in like USB and HDMI because they'll move away from you when you plug them in. So using, because there's only four screws, using all four is pretty important. Now they've given us an extra four for some reason. And what I'll do is I'm just, this bag is not resealable, but I can make it resealable. by just grabbing my stapler. And then I don't have to worry about the screws falling out and losing them. All right, so now I can bring this up without anything falling out and give you a nice close-up view. Here's what we got. I mean, that, that looks darn near factory perfect. The colors match perfectly. Now, when it comes to the cables, we've got our 24-pin motherboard cable that has to go on for power. We've got a fan cable. We've got... Right down here, we've got our CPU power. We've got the rear fan here to hook up. And then on this side, underneath the power cables, we have our audio cable. This cable here, USB 3, that's going to plug in right, right straight down there. So the cabling looks really easy on this, especially with those SATA cables out of the way. So let's see. Wow, this looks super convenient. Our front audio is right next to the power connector. So that cable only has to run right here. It only goes on one way, and it's very easy to tell which connector is for audio. It is very dark in there, though, so I need, some, I need additional lighting. Okay, so that, from here, just to the audio port, right, right next to the power connector right there, the big 24-pin power connector. This, as I mentioned, looks like our power switch and power LED. I'm counting one, two, three, four, five, six, so maybe there's a hard drive LED as well, or there doesn't appear to be a reset switch. So whatever that is, it's going to be, it'll light up on this side. This is where the button is. Once again, it's a, it's a very well-hidden power button. If I had to describe to somebody over the phone 
how to turn this on. I'd say, well, hit the button on the front. And they'd say, there is no button. But you got to look very, very carefully. Now, if that button were a different color, if it were red, it also looks like maybe there's some lights. And if we tilt down, you can see where I just plugged this audio cable in. If we tilt down, you can see the circuit board or the switch and the LEDs coming out to this ribbon cable. And I think that's going to plug in right over here. So it looks like they really thought, they being uh, Inwin, really thought this cabling out well because many ITX cases, they move the typical location of your audio port, your USB ports, and your power switch uh, front port umbilicals. They're not in the traditional spot. And then our USB 3 cable, again, it's right here on this side of the board. So I'll bring this back up and show you again. Our USB 3 cable just ran right down there. And I still am, I'm, now I'm going to hook up the front port uh, power switch and LED. I just have to look a little closer at this board. I believe. It's the connector right next to the USB, but I could be wrong. No, I think that's it. I believe that's the correct port. So all three cables I've hooked up that go to the front, look how convenient that is, also go to this one side. I've got to step over here. This one side of the board. So this cable is our audio cable. You see that goes here. This cable is our front port umbilicals, and that goes right there. And this is our USB 3 cable. And that goes right there. And that's going to give us what we need for our front connectivity for our USB port, our audio port, and our power switch and LEDs, which I'm holding it, looking right at it, and I'm having a hard time finding that button. <laughs> now we have motherboard power and this uh, rear case fan to hook up. We have a lot of fan headers right down here. So we'll probably run that cable. They give us a lot of cable here. If we have a closer fan header, we could run it there instead. It doesn't appear that we do. It looks like we just have two, two fan headers. That's it. They are white, and any other fan header would also be white. If you see other pins that stick up that match the same count of pins, but they don't have the white surround, like here, we've got a little three-pin connector right down there. That's not a fan connector. Now, they're not white on all motherboards, but this motherboard manufacturer from uh, Minis Farm, they have done us a solid by making sure they've color-coded that. I wish that was a standard. Paul Gray in Australia with 100, US, uh, sorry, 100 Australian dollars. Well, thank you, as always, to our friend Paul joining us from Australia. Of course, our friend Mitch is in Australia right now. I haven't heard from Mitch in a while. I'm going to hope no news is good news. He's keeping busy. Now, because this is just a 200-watt power supply, you really only get one SATA connector, and that's to power the two SSDs that are optional that I've removed, and then your motherboard power and CPU power. That's all you get. And the reason is if they gave you more, you'd probably overdrive it. So <clears throat> I want to think about how I want to... How do I want to do this? Let's move that out of the way. Hmm. Move this this way, maybe. So the cable management on this, 
won't be too bad because the cables aren't that long to begin with, right? But they're all just on one side. It sure would have been nice if they had just given us an extra inch of space, made this just an inch longer, just so we can stick the cables down in the trench. I think there's a little trench there now, but it's, it's going to be tight. This is our CPU power. I got to figure out how to route that all the way around here. So we certainly wouldn't want to go around this way. The cable will not be long enough. So we have no choice but to come up the same route. Also, let me take the wire tie off of the rear case fan because that has to go exactly the same route with the other coming from the other side. So the first thing you want to do is get all the bends out of there. We do have a cooling fan right down here on the NVMe drive and a fan here plus this fan here. And what we don't want to do is we don't want to have our cable in any way get caught up in any of these fans. So the cable management isn't just for looks. It's also to ensure that uh, your cable won't interfere. And you see they've got the cable on this fan coming out towards me, and I don't know why. I would think that cable should be coming out that way. But it does look like maybe this comes right out. Let me see. Something's holding us in. Oh. Okay, we'll check this out. I, I love figuring this stuff out. I would not want to read the walkthrough. I mean, the directions. I don't want the cheats. Okay, these screws are, again, a different size, so I'm going to make sure that... I put these screws back to this, this piece right here, which is what our fan is attached to. And what I'm showing you is that the cable's coming out this side, and I want the cable to come out the other side, so my, my route is gonna be, uh, the, the cable routing basically has to go across, to route this cable, I have to go this way. And I don't want it to rub against the fan or potentially get caught up in the blades. So this little piece that I've unscrewed, it has two little latches that hold the fan in. There's no other screws holding the fan in. So if I lift up that latch, and all I want to do is rotate so that this cable is coming out, this cable here is coming out of this side. And what's holding the fan in are these little plastic nubs and then the clips. That's great design. I really like that. So if I just rotate that, you know, the other thing that looks good is when the uh, logo on the fan is going to be upright. You'd think that's how they would have put it in at the factory. And then these are the holes where the screws were. Right here <laughs> and right there. So I know which way faces down because I want the, the, the cable facing down in this way. So we get it lined up with the little nubs up there and it should just lock in place and we can screw that back down. And now the cable will be coming out of the proper side. That's going to make this. Uh... Much easier to cable. Sorry, I lost my train of thought. All right, let me go back over here. And make sure I haven't turned myself around. So this is going to go in this way. Oh, this makes much more sense. Just like that. So remember, that's blowing air out the back, just like a traditional computer case would have a rear case fan blowing air out. Putting the wrong screws in, aren't I? It's these screws up here. That's it. Now, just hooking up these last two cables, we can test fire this bad boy and see if it works. So let's get the rear case fan plug in. I'll worry about prettying up the cables later but I'm gonna try my best to route it cleanly. We'll go right there. Doesn't matter which of the two uh, fan plugs we use, either one. 
And then finally, the CPU power cable, which I have to figure out how to run that. I'll tell you what, for right now, let's just get it plugged in. I'll worry about making it pretty later. Basically, what we've got to do with the rest of these cables is get them all jammed in here without interfering with any of the fans or the airflow, right? So just laying them in here just to test it. We don't want to go any further if we, uh, we don't get a power on, right, if we don't post. And then we can also put the bottom back on because I'm not going to, uh, for the fifth time, put two and a half inch drives in there. This will only go in one way. So the screws are going to go towards me. And these longer coarse threaded screws are the ones that came out of here. Don't over tighten these, it's just a plastic cover. Fastest build ever. Okay, let's, uh, let's plug it in and see what it does. Not too shabby, not too shabby. Uh, I need power, so I'll use my power that I already have here. That cable get shorter? No, just me. It's got to be on the wrong side, of course. We also have to get um, internet, HDMI. And then we need a keyboard and a mouse. And we can fire this bad boy up. Garfield Rupe renews his membership. Uh, thank you, Garfield. Good to see you. All right, let me get this plugged in. I'll use this front USB port. That'll test it at the same time. And let's go to my HDMI input over here so we can see what this does together and react to it together. Let me put myself here on camera one, a little up in the corner is I still want you to see this when I turn it on. Okay, here we go, power. Fan is turning. We do have a blue power light up here on the front. I don't know if there's a hard drive light blinking or not, but I do see a blue power light that does indicate where our switch is. It's perfectly silent. That's why I went with the Noctua fan. And let's turn off camera one so we can get a good look at this desktop. Take a look at our configuration on this guy. I mean, a lot of stuff going on. Oh, I got to activate Windows. I'll be going to VIP CDK deals later. Uh, Crystal. Well, first of all, let's do let's do system. I mean, that's dead quiet. I see the fan, but I do not hear it at all. I mean, zero noise. Also, the little tiny fan for the NVMe is turning, and I don't hear that one either. They are completely dead silent. And if the power supply has a fan, I don't hear that one. I mean, just nothing. So here's our AMD Ryzen 7 7745 with our built-in Radeon graphics with 32 gigs of uh, SODIMM RAM, DDR4, I believe it is. We're running Windows 11 Pro 23H2. And if we run Crystal Dismark, we should see some giant numbers. We do live in a world where you get what you pay for. I know this board isn't exactly a bargain hunter's dream if what you're looking for is cheap. But if what you're looking for is value, performance, and you don't want to spend top dollar for it, that's where this board comes in. Let's see if we're going to get Gen 5 speeds out of this thing. We're getting Gen 4 speeds, it looks like. At 7,400, we should be getting 12,000. So I can't help but wonder if maybe that's not actually a Gen 5 slot. Now, one of the problems with the board design, if you want to call it a problem, is to get to the NVMe drives, we, we have to take out the two fans. Um, at 7,400, I mean, let's face it, that's, that's no slouch, but that's also not the Gen 5 I'm looking for. I'm looking for 10,000 or better. 
I kind of feel like that's running at the top end of Gen 4. So I need to check the specs one more time on the board to verify that is a Gen 5 capable board on the M.2 side, or if it's only one M.2 drive that's Gen 5, because those are, those are Gen 4, the top end of Gen 4 speeds is what we're getting now. And I can buy a Gen 4 drive for less money than this. This is a two terabyte crucial T700 drive. Peter VZ with a one euro contribution. Thank you, Peter. Joining us from Amsterdam. So while that's running, I'm gonna put this extra screws back in this plastic bag that had those rubber feed or covers in them. We'll keep that all together. That'll go back in the motherboard box for this build in case there are any changes that we need in the future. And then I'm gonna grab a separate Ziploc bag and put the SATA connectors. I just think having those SATA connectors really overcrowds the case. And I feel like this isn't really something you should need two uh, SATA drives for. You've got two NVMe slots and a network connection. It's not exactly a server, you know what I mean? So you could use it as a media server. You could use it to do pretty much anything and just buy a big NVMe if you need a lot of storage, buy two of them. Or plug a USB drive in or use network attached storage. Kind of forces you to back your data up. Too many people, in my opinion, they just rely on their internal storage. They don't back it up. When their internal storage dies and they have a bunch of it, you know, like very large internal storage, they lose a lot. So I just don't want to see that happen to any of you. Just about done with our numbers here. Really feels like Gen 4 to me. Let's see if I can go back to this forum site here. What do they say about it? Sometimes I go through this stuff so quickly. That's where it said Gen 5, though. PCI 5 is the PCI Express slot, but the M.2 slots don't say they're Gen. They don't say what generation they are. Let's keep scrolling and see. Now, there's the two M.2 slots. And again, you can go back to the original video from December 1st that we did and see me put the drive in. Now that has a cover on it. Weird. PCIe 5 M.2. It says PCIe 5 times 4. So I'm not dreaming it. Are they both 5? It says they're both PCIe 5 slots. I should be getting Gen 5 speeds. Am I not getting Gen 5 speeds? This is the heat sink without the noctual fan on top of it. That's why that looks different. And it looks like they have these posts there for putting a 140 millimeter fan in and screwing it down. So it is designed to have a fan of this, this size put onto it.
Oh, Sports AK as well. Wow. Matched cases. Oh, they should include this case in there. I'll tell you what, I never noticed this before. I'm going to have to write to them and let them know this in-win case is a great solution for this. Okay, uh, let me go back to my input. We got our final numbers. Let's do, let's see, file. Save image. Still. Disk mark. JPEG. The desktop. Perfect. And oh, my screen is frozen up over here. So. Just getting the spinning circle on my, my tablet here, and it looks like it just happened. Sometimes, the best way to resolve this is to reboot it. And people are like, ah, the reboot takes too long. I, I can close it and reopen it. But then by the time you do that, you could have rebooted it, which is going to close it and reopen it. Um, maybe a network connection here issue for me and my network. But, uh, yeah. Don't be started. All right, well, that's doing that. Let's go back to camera one, and we'll go full screen on camera one. Here I am. I'm wondering, did I not put the T700 in? I mean, I've got the box. Is the box empty? No. You know what? I never installed it. So then what the heck do I have in there? This must have been for me to do later, and I forgot and thought that was an empty box to remind me. In theory, we should get up to 12,400 megabytes per second read speeds with that drive. I probably have a Beijing or something in there. Let's, let's take another look because, well, we're just full of surprises today. To go full screen on my side here. Right click, properties, hardware, Beijing. So that is a Gen 4 drive running at top Gen 4 speeds. I mean, that's nothing to shake a stick at, let me tell you. Um, I must have just forgotten. And I can put both drives in. I can have the Crucial and the Beijing side by side, one Gen 4, one Gen 5. The Gen 5 one should run at Gen 5 speeds. But I want to try one other thing. Let's shut this down real quick. And just to, just to get an idea, get back in the chat room. just happened yeah my tablet is really having a hard time um, connecting to my network here locally so something's happening so I will rely on just looking at that chat Oh, I'm looking now that the local network here has gone down. My TP-Link router, thank goodness we're on two separate connections. 
We are still connected through the secondary connection. We're good. My internal connection is down. So that would force Mara offline and that would also force my tablet offline. I don't know what happened. It's the router is not happy. It's not getting us. It's not talking to the cable modem properly. So usually that just fixes itself. And of course, it's going to only happen during a live broadcast. Anyway, so what I wanted to do is I just wanted to get an idea of what this is going to look like when it's done. So I just wanted to throw the cover on it just to pretend like, you know, hey, look what we did. So without trapping any cables, all right, just if I get the cables out of the way enough for the lid to go on. Yeah, I can see that's, that's a stiff cable and that's going to fight us. There is a cable right there that's binding. It's getting trapped. Well, now I know why it clips in. one little part here that needs to come down. So close. So that's the problem when you have too many cables. But, as you can see, we can set it up like this if we want. You know, keeping in mind of your cable distance. Just like that. Looks like it just goes into the grooves and it slides around in there. And then if we turn it on, again, I'm trying to find that power button. <laughs> Where is it? I, d I find it easier to feel for it than to look for it. Hit that power button. Blue light comes on. There's a blue light there. I think that's the only light that's on it. Oh, no, wait a minute. The blue light has a red light behind it. And so as the operating system's loading, as it's reading and writing to this internal solid state drive, that light, the red light is blinking just beside the blue light. So it looks like you're getting pulled over. Now, look, if we were lazy, we could put the screws in it, call it a day, and just who's going to see the cables? The problem is the cables, well, it looks like we came back up online now. So Mara should be able to reconnect now. And this should also reconnect. That was weird. Does anybody have any questions for me? And that'll wrap it up otherwise for what is the Bajan guy wants to know what's the squiggly thing at the top squiggly thing at the top of what the top of the motherboard the top of the case the top of the desk top of my neck that's my head. El Perez says hello. 1K Viper says hello. Luke Greeny wants me to check my phone. That's a great idea. Thank you, Luke. Forgotten to do that. Let me reconnect over here on the tablet. It's only a Wednesday. You know, it's a Wednesday afternoon. It's uh, almost 2.30 in the afternoon here in Phoenix. To have the internet go down like that is very unusual. 
Bone check. $25 from our friend Luke Greenia via PayPal. Thank you for that, Luke. Alan Lindos sends an Amazon gift card. Says, I can't interact with chat. Kind of stinks. I guess it keeps the trolls from messing up the channel. I'll do my usual $7.77 fee this way. Well, it's easy enough, Alan, just to become a member. And that membership then would replace your super chat, right? And then you can hang out with us in chat. Unfortunately, I don't have any way that I'm aware of yet to make any exemptions, like it's YouTube's rules. You turn it on or you turn it off. There's no sort of turn it on for some people and turn it off for other people. Um, but I really appreciate your, your thoughtfulness and your contribution, and I hope you'll consider becoming a member. Certainly uh, miss him in the chat room. I knew there was gonna be collateral damage from doing this, but this is just where we're at with society and their behaviors. Um, I think the last few videos by secluding the uh, the chat to members only has certainly improved the uh, tone of these videos where they can often start out very professional and then it becomes unprofessional in my opinion when I have to keep defending myself against people looking for attention or spreading false information, which I feel you know I have to stop in its tracks. And so that distracts me from the content, it upsets my mood and then I don't feel the video is, it came out the way I wanted it to. And that live interaction, you know, it invites hecklers and it invites attention seekers and invites spots and spammers. And so what we're trying to do here is still let people watch the videos for free. But if they want to interact during the live video, because they have the ability to disrupt the video or change the tone of the video, um, it, it's really affecting the entire channel. And so, while that represents a very small portion of, of chat users, there are no paying members that do that. So because of that, this, consider it like a classroom. If you want to attend the college class, you have to pay to attend the class. If you'd like to watch a video of the class, that's free. So it's, it's kind of like that. If you want to interact with the instructor, you've got to be in the class. If you want to be a spectator watching, we, we're keeping that free. And this is how we're able to keep it free. Without the members, there may be just one video a month, if that, and it would be costing me money for people to watch me. So we're trying to find a balance to it, and I hope you understand it's just society, culture. We are worldwide, so even the cultures aren't the same from country to country where we are. And what some people think is funny, other people think is bullying. But I have I really think this has worked out well. I think that the... Um, the members only chat has kept this far more professional and far more uh, on focus to the subject matter without, you know, I have enough distraction, enough squirrels to have somebody bring something up or ask a silly question that we've addressed 25 times before. Uh, and they don't want to go back and look through the library. They, you know, want me to serve them. Well, if you're paying me, I'm happy to serve you. And therefore, when all of that flooding happens in the chat room, I don't see the the members and the supporters' questions get lost in the chaos and the noise. So in this way, I can give everybody in the chat room attention, whereas before I couldn't because we have a less, the chat room's not as populated. So there's a better chance, 100% well, chance, I'm going to see you. And if you have a question, I'm going to see it. You're not going to be drowned out through the noise of uh, free viewers just drowning you completely out. So I think it's better for the viewers who are here sincerely you know, and have a question and want my attention. I think it works out for everybody. And that's why we're doing it. So yeah, I hope you consider becoming a member. And then that keeps us from having to make a sponsorship deal with some corporation that's going to tell us what we're allowed to say, when we say it, how we say it, and wouldn't even be able to do it live, because they'd have to approve it before that we'd be allowed to air it, or they wouldn't pay us. I don't want to go that route. That's pretty much nearly every tech channel on YouTube anyway. Anyway, uh, Peter VZ with a one euro contribution joining us from Amsterdam. Luke Greenia renews his membership, now a member for 26 months. Right on. Thank you, Luke. 
David Graham with a $2 super chat. He says there's a professor fee. <laughs> Uh, let's see. Wayne Ellison says, hey, Carrie, Texas Troubleshooter, great program. Right now, thank you, Wayne. That's a pretty interesting looking case. What do you guys think of this case? You know, the fact that it comes with that 200 watt power supply seals the deal for me. I've never seen a case like it. Does it have any of you seen this case on any other YouTube channel? I haven't. And this motherboard fits in there like a glove. The members remember my struggle with this motherboard <laughs> on Monday. But looks like things were meant to happen. This is way better. There's our friend Paul Gray with another hundred Australian dollar contribution in Super Chat. Thank you, he says. Carrie and Marlena in the chat for all you do for us here in the chat room. Well, thank you for supporting the channel and your extreme generosity. Very kind of you. Very kind. We appreciate you very much. Samuel Kowalski says, I love that case. James Carter says, I think the case is really cool. Bajan Guy says, it's an interesting looking case, but a rather tight fit though. Well, the smaller we go, <laughs> the tighter the fit's going to be. We could put that same motherboard into a giant Be Quiet Pure Base 800, but it's going to look a little silly. It'd be like wearing a shoe that's 20 sizes too big. Let me put Shaquille O'Neal's shoes on. See what they look like on me. So, you know, the small bundle board is designed to be in a small tight fit case. And if you look at a mini PC, you know, there's very little upgrade you can do to that. And they, they're, you know, maybe a third of the size. But because it's all built into the board, there's very little cabling to deal with. So as long as you want that customization and control, and the, the varying, changing the board out and things that you can't do on a mini PC. Um, you have that right here. But yes, it is a tight fit for sure. And again, if we left the SATA connectors with the SATA cables, you're just going to have to get really creative with how you manage and route those cables. Obviously, it can be done. Otherwise, they wouldn't include it. People have done it. Jose Lopez contributes two bucks. Right on. Thank you, Jose. He says, great bid, Kerry. Mark Gaines with a five pound super chat joining us from Northern Ireland says, I really like that case. Bajan guy wants to know if I can restart it again. Absolutely. Let me get back to, where am I? I'm over here. Let's go back over here. Go full screen so I can see it the way you guys at home see it. There it is. You want me to restart? Oh, I just shut it down. Whoopsie. Hold on a second. Let me turn it back on. Where's the power button? Find the power. There it is. And press. Here we go. Sorry, I'll do a restart. I, I hit the wrong button. So we'll wait for it to come up. Give that a second to finish loading. What's going on down here? It's upset about something. This nonsense. Okay. Now we'll do a restart. Start. Shut down. Restart. I guess maybe you want to time how long it takes to restart. I'm guessing. So that's all live. And I'm not sure why we're getting the the discoloration at the top of the screen there, but it's probably something to do with the capture card. Everybody says that's fast. Oh, it's fast. Yeah, we're back up. Just as a reminder, looking at the specifications of the board, you know, it's no slouch. That AMD Ryzen 7. Did I put the uh, adrenaline software? I don't see the adrenaline software. Do we have everything in the device manager loaded? Yeah, it looks good. Well, I guess I should put the adrenaline software on it. Do 
We want the drivers. Remember, that's going to install the drivers for the uh, onboard uh, built-in graphics card as well. So if you want the best performance out of an AMD chip, you definitely want to have the latest uh, AMD Adrenaline software. So if you think it's fast now, once we get the latest drivers on there, it will be even better, especially in gaming. So we'll let that run for a second. Hmm. Mara should be able to connect again. Yeah, it looks like she's back in there. Hit next on here. And install. Can't really read this when it's over there. Let's move it so I can see it. These are the drivers it's putting in. Very good. Install. Normally, it wouldn't take this long to install, but my internet's acting up today, so that's why that's happening. All right, let's see what I've missed here in the chat room. Bajan guy says it looks like there's some kind of logo over the fan on the case. Uh, at the top of the case, the, the in-wind logo is on the mesh. And you can uh, go back, rewind this video. The DVR mode is on when I was showing the website for the case. And you can see what that logo looks like from their product marketing pictures, which may be showing it better than, you know, the cameras picking it up. I guess that's what he was talking about, the squiggly thing at the top. Oh, it, it does kind of look like a squiggly thing at the top, doesn't it? Then Wynn's logo is kind of looks like a Jackson Pollock, uh, like they hired him to do it. Ron Barnish joins us and says hello. There's Jit. Rajan guy says, Mara told me what it was. Okay. <laughs> Took me a while to get on board with that discussion. Sorry about that. All right. So this is going to take a couple of minutes to install. And then once that's installed, we should be current. We should see a little red logo down here in the system tray. It might be hidden. And of course I can, oh, it's right there. I can choose to unhide that. Right click taskbar settings. And then, uh, Where is it? System tray icons, AMD software host application, turn that. I don't want that hidden. I want to see the AMD Adrenaline software down there running. Otherwise, I wonder, did I install it? So all the links for the motherboard um, to the original video from December 1st that we reviewed this board and, and uh, prepped it. Uh, to the links to this particular case, 
The case is $125 today, July 17th, 2024. Prices and availability are subject to change. If you're watching this video in 2029, they probably don't make it anymore. But that being said, um, they have it in white as well. We went with all black, and I'm glad we did, given the color of the I.O. Shield. And uh, the I.O. Shield install was kind of weird. But everything about this case is kind of weird, which is why I wanted to do it. It's different than, you know, the typical builds we do. And I needed to do something with this board. I didn't have really a case to put it in. So I think this really worked out. Again, uh, I was expecting to have to put a power supply in there. And that's 75 bucks, and the case is another 80 or 90. So for 125, I get the case of power supply, and I get something different, and it's relatively easy to work on. Pretty straightforward. I love how all the cables are at the front plug into the same side of the motherboard. Because on the train PC, that's a nightmare. Cables go on one side, cables go on the other side. It's, it's a mess. This one seems much more thought out. Paul Gray with the $20 Australian Super Chat. Thank you, Paul. Mara says the all-white was strange. It looked like a bathroom accessory. Hey, it could be. I don't know what the heck's going on in there with some people. Hook it up to your VR headset while you're sitting on the toilet. Sure, why not? <laughs> Douglas Burchell says hello. Welcome in, Douglas. That should be loading the video driver right there. That's why it's blanking out. And then it'll come back. Like I said, this will cover the AMD chipset driver as well as AMD GPU driver. And then that will have to restart to take those drivers to take over. So we'll restart it. This restart may take a little longer than a normal restart as it's replacing the drivers in use with the new updated drivers. And then once it does that, it can restart Windows. It's like changing the tires on a car. you got to stop the car. <laughs> and then we can take tires off, put new tires on, and then we can, you know, can roll again. Kind of like that. How is Mitch doing? You can follow Mitch on Facebook, Mitch Morrison. And he's been posting photos. I haven't heard from him since he left, so I assume... You know, the only thing I'm getting from Mitch is what he's posting on Facebook, and he's only posting maybe one picture a day. Uh, I haven't checked it today. We have not heard from him yet. He's supposed to send us maybe a couple short clips when he has time. So I'm going to assume no news is good news, and I'll assume he's just busy having a good time. Go right-click Device Manager. Okay, we're all happy in here, which we were before, just making sure. I can double click down on the AMD Adrenaline software, make sure we've got the latest version. I'll hit skip this for now. And we're gonna look, we have 24.6.1. We can check for updates just to make sure. It is up to date, very good. I can get rid of this notification. All right, everything's happy. So if I want to take the uh, fans off of it and put the, the Gen 5 NVMe in there, it's certainly an option. It's really, apart from running Crystal Disk Mark, you're likely not going to tell the difference between 7,400 megabytes per second and 12,400. You're going to see it in benchmarks, but as far as your Windows booting or loading applications, it's milliseconds. So unless you're loading a lot of stuff all the time, and it's all got to be internal, the minute you have to go out to the network or to a USB drive, this thing cannot run at 12,400 because it would have to have something else that could keep up with it. So at the end of the day, is it worth spending the extra 100 bucks or whatever for the Gen 5? I mean, that's up to you to decide. The two terabyte drive that's Gen 5 is about $100 more than the same two terabyte drive that's Gen 4, which is probably, I don't know, 50 bucks more than a Gen 3. And most people wouldn't even notice the difference between Gen 3 and Gen 4, or Gen 3 and Gen 5. It is already so much faster than all the other devices you're communicating with that apart from looking at the benchmarks and drooling, the actual practical application of that being uh, useful or 
uh, enabling you to be more productive is highly unlikely. I mean, you'd have to do an extreme amount of IO. Maybe you're gaming on this and you want your in between levels to load faster. If, if a second or two seconds of uh, different level loading is worth spending the money and, and buying something like this, have at it. Gaming can be a very, very expensive luxury. And um, I just, whether or not I, it's something that interests me, my goal is to give you all the information, the pros and the cons. I'm not going to sit there and say, look how great the drive is, look how fast it is, without also telling you it probably won't make any real difference in the way you use your computer, unless you're some power user. And if you are, then you already know whether you don't need me to explain this to you. And I think at the end of the day, again, I think that the Gen 4 drive that's in here is more than, more than adequate. And I think it would be a waste of time and money to put this in just so I can run Crystal Disk Mark and see 12,000 plus mega. And then I'm like, oh, it's 12,000. But it's still going to boot in the same amount of time. It's still two terabytes. It's, everything's going to be the same. And this will also run hotter. Is it worth it? Spend more, run hotter. See bigger numbers in the benchmark, but milliseconds of speed difference in loading. You decide. Samuel Kowalski said that Matt, Mitch is probably having too much fun. Well, I hope so. Imagine, guys, that he's trying to see if the CPU fan is spinning. Can be a little difficult to tell, can't it? So the problem with these um, noctual fans is the way they've got them painted is you're seeing all the support beams behind the fan. When the fan is spinning, it more or less becomes invisible. So you'll notice when I shut this off, if I go back over to the desktop here for just a moment, this may be the best way for you to see it. If we come over here and do the shutdown, And while that shuts down, let me get back over to camera one. And you should see that fan start to slow down, and then you can see it stop. So <clears throat> because it's dead silent, and when you look at it casually, you don't see, all you see are the support structures. You think, is the fan even spinning? But if you actually are standing where I am and you, you know, look at it close up, you can see the fan. The camera's not picking it up well, nor can you really see it from a distance very well. And if I turn it back on, you'll see it spin up. And it's really that motion of starting or stopping is when you're going to see the fan from the camera's perspective. <clears throat> Chris Johnson says hello. There's uh, Andy Kane. All right, guys, so <clears throat> if I have missed anything earlier, um, please go ahead and repost it. And we're just about at the two-hour mark, so I think this will wrap it up for today. I may just end up putting these screws back in there, get to it later. And I don't think I'm going to use this in this build, so I think I'm going to go ahead and put this <clears throat> back on the inventory shelf. I think I was going to use this just to see if it was Gen 5. I believe it is. I also believe... This would be a waste to put it in there because I'm not even sure if I have any use for this, let alone that it would be so demanding as to justify the investment of a Gen 5 drive. So outside of just putting it in the test to make sure, that's a more work than I want to do. So I think I'll put the screws back in so I don't lose them. I've already got the uh, SATA cables and screws in this bag. I've got the rest of what the case came with in this bag. And we have our power cable. Now, all of this will go into the motherboard box. This will go back on inventory, show up in something else. And then later on, if I feel like it, or when I feel like it, I can open it up and tidy up the cables. It's good enough for now. I can move it that way much easier than moving the board and uh, the case separately. And um, again, we can lay it completely flat if we don't want it to be vertical. And remove that just set it down this way. It may make a nice um, 
home theater style of PC or, uh, I don't know, uh, even just a personal PC for a lot of people. If you want something that's a bit more customized, a lot more customizable than a mini PC, which is essentially a pre-built computer. This is one you build yourself. You're going to, you can decide to put a regular mini ITX board that can take Intel or AMD desktop CPUs. This uses a mobile CPU. So it's soldered into the board and you can't change it. However, for everything you're getting for the money, it's a bargain. So if you were to buy a mini ITX board along with the equivalent AMD CPU and the cooler, remember this has the cooler, we just had to add the fan. And that board had the same capabilities. It was equal to or greater than the number of USB ports, video output ports, 8K display. Again, the equivalent desktop CPU. Um, I think you're gonna find this is a bargain all day. This is also lower power consumption. It doesn't generate as much heat as a desktop CPU, but that also means, uh, you know, the CPU is soldered in, you can't change it. Also, because it's a laptop CPU, which is often what's used on mini PCs, we're using laptop RAM. That's a new one for me. Every mini ITX board I've ever seen uses all standard desktop components the same way a bigger motherboard does. Same type of CPU, same type of RAM, DDR4, DDR5. But because we're mobile on desktop here, we're using laptop parts that are soldered in, in the case of the CPU, and it reduces some of the customization that's possible, but still more customization and more power than most mini PCs, and certainly at that price. So at the end of the, again, at the end of the day, it's gonna be my expression today. At the end of the day, it's up to you to decide where the value is for you. What's it worth? Uh, it's a very unique looking case. And um, it almost looks like a projector. Like if I just glanced at that, I'd think you had some kind of a projector. So it might match your uh, motif of your uh, theater room, or again, just as a, a desktop to have on your desk. It takes up a lot less space and gives you a lot more flexibility than a standard mini PC. Paul Gray with another $20 super chat, 20 Australian bucks. Thank you, Paul. Ajin guy said, I thought this had RGB. So no, this case, this motherboard and this case do not have RGB. There are pictures of this case where somebody has installed a normal ITX motherboard using DDR4 or DDR5 RAM. It has RGB on the top that's shining through the mesh top. I think that's the RGB you're seeing. This is a very unusual mini ITX board in that we've got the mobile chip. And, you know, you let me know if you find RGB on laptop RAM. In most cases, you don't see laptop RAM. It would make sense to put it on there. We do have an Ace Magic Mini PC that does have laptop RAM with RGB. And I don't know why people aren't talking about it because you can't buy it. As far as I can tell, it's not for sale. But they have a little window in the case so you can see the colors of the RAM, you know, the, the lighting on the RAM. But that also means that if you replace the RAM by upgrading it, you won't have that RGB anymore because you can't buy you know, prove me wrong. Find me a link where you can buy a laptop RAM with RGB on it. Anyway, most people are going to build this with a standard mini ITX board. This is not standard. That's why we reviewed it. This is different. Again, this is mobile processor on a, on a desktop motherboard that uses laptop RAM. It's a really cool twist. And laptops have to be very... Um, power conservative, right, to save on batteries. So laptop parts use less power. They also generate less heat, so they're easier to cool. And they're also physically smaller. A laptop CPU, for example, is about a quarter or half the size of a standard desktop CPU. So in some cases, they're not exactly identical in performance, right, because the more power you're going to give it, the higher the performance is going to be but also the greater heat is going to be harder to cool and you're going to need a bigger power supply. So we have a machine here that's very efficient with its power, very customizable. If we decide we don't like the mobile on desktop, we can just pull that board out, put a standard mini ITX in, 
Intel or AMD with standard desktop RAM, move the SSD over, we're back in business again. What we can't do is we cannot plug a GPU in here. So the PCIe, uh, the PCI Express slot that's on the motherboard is useless to us. There is no card, as far as I'm aware, that will fit in other than maybe adding a little another SSD. They have these little cards you can plug in. Maybe. But I mean, it's already got a slot for, for two M.2s already. And if you keep the uh, SATA ports in there, you have the addition of two additional slow, but additional two and a half inch hard drives or solid state drives. And also adding five more cables. All right, I think I'll wrap it up for me. Guys, thank you so much for being members, for supporting the channel. Paul Gray, thank you for your generosity. We appreciate you very much. Uh, Paul had sent in an Amazon gift card from Australia. And you can only use that in Australia. So if you're buying an Amazon gift card, you have to buy it for the US. And if you're not sure how to do that, or you've purchased one by mistake, like Amazon in Australia means I have to spend the money, or I can only redeem the gift card at amazon.com.au, where I do not have an account. So I can't use it. But the money's not lost. You can go into your accounts, your order history, and you can cancel that. Or if you're having any difficulty, you can reach out to Amazon's customer service, and they can help you refund that. And then if you wanted to get it in the um, a gift card for amazon.com, and you're not sure how to do it, their customer service can show you how to do that. I don't know how it's done. Um, we have many viewers in England that send us Amazon.com gift cards, but initially many of them had sent us Amazon.co.uk gift cards, which we can't use. Well, we could use it. It just means I have to order from the UK, create an account on Amazon.co.uk, then I can redeem the gift card, then I can make the order, and then I can wait two weeks for it to arrive. Yeah, that's just, I can order the same thing here and have it the next day. And I don't even know how returns would work because it's got to go through customs. But we certainly appreciate the thought and we appreciate the generosity regardless. Uh, it, it's just really special that people show such kindness and support and it means a lot. So thank you to all of my friends in green, including those that are gonna watch later. We don't have all the members watching live at the same time. So if you're a member not joining us in the chat, we hope we'll see you next time. And to thank to them, of course, for being members, not just the people in the chat, but the people that'll watch later. And of course, to all of our viewers, we appreciate you. We do keep the chat open to the public before the show starts. It's only when the show goes live that we restrict the chat so as not to disrupt the show. Thank you so much. Thank you to our friends at Acronis True Image, our friends at RoboForm for password management, and our friends at VIP CDK Deals, where you can get Windows and Office license keys, all fully legitimate and legal and guaranteed at a fraction of Microsoft's retail price. Guess where I'm gonna go to get the license for this? I think it's $16.55 for a Windows 10 Pro license, and I will enter the Windows 10 Pro license on Windows 11 Pro, and it'll activate. Why not buy a Windows 11 Pro license? It's a couple dollars more. So if you're buying 100 license keys, a couple dollars can be a couple hundred dollars in savings. Um, but yeah, the Windows 10 Pro key will activate Windows 11 Pro. A Windows 10 Home will activate a Windows 11 Home. Um, you do not have to install Windows 10 prior. The, the product code can just be entered the same and it will activate the same on both 10 and 11. As long as Home to Home and Pro to Pro, you're fine. Okay, thank you to Marlena, of course, for doing all the work in the background and uh, the thumbnails and the video notes and all the administration. Apologize we had that weird internet problem here, but at least it didn't affect the broadcasting out. And even if it did, we record every stream locally to the streamer to have as a backup. So we're covered across the bases. Hopefully when we're in Studio C, this problem goes away entirely. It's inexplicable. I don't know why it happened. But um, we do have two separate network connections here that complicates things. And at Studio C, we'll have one network connection that's two and a half times what this is in performance. So it should be rock solid. That'll wrap it up for me for today. I will see you all again on Friday at one o'clock. 
where we're going to continue the MuseTex K2 build, hopefully get that finalized. I hope you'll join us for that. That's one o'clock Pacific time. And uh, thank you again. Until next time. Bye for now.